Welcome to Saks Realty's Tuesday Night Podcast, where we talk about anything and everything real estate. Each week, we deliver expert information, enabling you to make better informed decisions while keeping more money in your pocket. If you're interested in real estate, this is your show. Guys, welcome, welcome to our Tuesday Night Podcast. We are live as always, and we appreciate you spending your Tuesday evenings with us. Now, kind of a lot going on around the U.S. with the housing market, and tonight we have a really special guest. We're going to talk about something that a whole lot of people don't know a whole lot about, and sometimes I mention like Airbnb to people, and they're like, what's that? They have no idea. It's not just, you know, old people either. It's a lot of young people too. They've never stayed in these short-term rentals. We're going to talk a little bit about it tonight because we're going to learn that there's been a big sort of a huge increase in the last year alone of Airbnb inventory. I don't know where these places are coming from. I mean, home buyers can't even find a home to buy, but plenty of people are finding these Airbnbs. We're going to talk about that tonight uh, because there has been a massive year over year or month over month, at least for the, the last eight months, I believe. We've seen a big decline in the revenue in the short term rental business. So we're going to talk about that tonight. Um, But really, I'm going to kind of hold back from talking about, geez, today the Fed, the FOMC meeting, uh, was was day one of the January meeting, last day of January. And I think tomorrow, um, we're going to hear from Jay Powell, and we're going to find out what's going on with the old FOMC and what they're thinking about this economy that we're living in. Uh, they're probably going to tell us that things are getting better. I, I mean, I don't know. I've been in the grocery store a couple times in the last week, and it doesn't seem like the groceries are getting any cheaper. But I think they're going to tell us that inflation is coming down a little bit. And uh, But I still think they're going to stay on the interest rates. I think they're thinking that he's going to announce a quarter of a point increase tomorrow. But anyway, guys, we're going to, again, you can tell I'm really... I'm pulled here because I'm ready for tomorrow to hear this big announcement. Uh, but anyway, thanks for joining us. Melissa, as always, I appreciate you. You know, I, we you know, Tuesday evenings here on the East Coast, our guest is from the East Coast too. But, I mean, we've been like working since very early this morning. So I always appreciate your dedication Thank to you. our audience. Yes, Tuesdays are the long, longest day of the week, but... It's a lot of fun. We have, there's a lot going on. It's very exciting here at Saks Realty. And, you know, we have the meeting, as you said, the Fed is meeting. Everyone, Todd, I can tell you're amped to hear what the result is going to be from that meeting. But tonight, Amir, thank you so much for being our guest. You are the expert on Airbnbs. And you guys, keep those comments and questions coming. I'm going to be moderating here and feeding them to Amir and Todd. And we're looking forward to another great Tuesday night. So Amir Dukic, welcome to our show. You were a, uh, you were referred to us by somebody very dear to us, a returning contributor several times. Uh, Dana Dunford, big shout out to her. Uh, She's at a birthday party right now. Um, And, uh, you know, but she has an amazing platform, Hem Lane, that helps, um, I mean, really, I mean, the data that they have in, you know, their position in the rental market at, with this software program that they have, uh, they really have a pulse on what's going on, especially with shelter inflation. But you, Amir, you have a different pulse on things. You have the pulse on the short-term rental business. So welcome to our show. Tell everybody who you are and what you do. Absolutely, Todd, Melissa, thank you for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, as you guys mentioned, Dana, Dana uh, shot me an email earlier today she said hey can you jump on this podcast um love these guys they are trying to learn about short-term rentals you know it'd be great to provide some data on it and you know anytime dana recommends somebody emblem great product dana incredibly impressive so i was more than happy to do it uh and i can make the time work so thanks for having me yeah uh, best way to think about rubble will be built a platform to help buyers find uh and operate short-term rentals so we have a data tool that helps you underwrite any property to see how much you could make as uh, as an Airbnb. 
Uh, and then we have a property management platform uh, operations company, basically, that can operate these Airbnbs for you. Uh, we currently operate about 400 Airbnbs nationwide uh, based in Charlotte, North Carolina, but have properties all across kind of the East Coast and all the way all the way down to basically Seattle and in, in California. So really a uh, big, big, big focus on short-term rentals, anything related to Airbnb data performance uh, and even operations. So really we try to be the go-to destination for anyone who's looking to buy a short-term rental, understand more about short-term rentals or Airbnbs in general. Yeah, well, we're very appreciative of your time. Uh, I have a lot of questions myself uh, as it pertains to this type of, you know, uh, business model. Uh, you know, obviously we are challenged. I mean, it's, it's, you know, crazy. We're going to, we're, we're going to save you from, you know, um, a lot of the opinions, you know, because we serve um, both buyers and sellers, but we serve investors too, you know, here at mm -hmm. Saks Realty. And, uh, and, and I've invested in real estate for the last 25 years myself. I mean, I, you know, um, you know purchased a building that, our one office is in and you know so um you know i get it you know real estate permanence of investment but there are a lot of things this is kind of like a new trending thing and it's been trending over several years i mean it's not that new um you know this short-term rental business and it's sort of really fueled and i want to hear from you you know about this to kind of segue us into this because i saw sort of like the biggest uptick in interest from people kind of wanting second home or second homes or vacation uh, homes, especially at the beginning of the pandemic. It was like, and maybe not so much the beginning, but by the time, you know, people were really in the lockdown mode, um, you know, is when I saw it the biggest. Can you kind of just explain what, a short-term rental is for people that don't know and then you know how long you know have when did this kind of start when did this trend start and you know really competing against hotels right mm -hmm. who would think Airbnb would single-handedly impact the hotel business and I know you deal with some hotels yourself as far as managing them but kind of give us an overview of what this is and how long it's been around yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I guess, you know, short-term rentals aren't really that new, right? Before Airbnb, there's been really what, what people consider more vacation rentals. Verbo has been around for 20, 30 years. Home, Home Away was another similar platform to VRBO, vacation rentals by owner. Uh, they have been around for a while and they would traditionally be, hey, I'm going to buy a beach house in, you know, uh, Hilton Head or in, you know, Savannah or somewhere, you know, on a destination where I want to visit, you know, a few times during the year. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to put it on, you know, these vacation rental channels, hoping to offset some of my costs that I'm carrying, right? So it's really a luxury for people who could afford second homes as a way to minimize their liabilities that they're carrying, right? So they could almost, you know, stay for free when they do go travel as a family to, to their vacation home. So that's been around for decades, right? Um, and it's not anything new. What really changed was about, you know, I think about a dozen years ago or so now, Airbnb came into the picture. And the biggest difference between what Airbnb did uh, and what, you know, you did with vacation rentals, tradition, traditional vacation rentals, is that Airbnb started off by allowing you to rent out a spare bedroom in your house, right? Hey, I live in New York City. Um, I'm going to be traveling to Miami or to New York or else the case may be. I'm going to put my bedroom for sales. It's, it's a way for me to make some money while I'm gone. Maybe even help pay for my trip, right? Or, you know, I bought a three-bedroom house. I have a, a, I have a spare bedroom that I'm not using. Maybe I'll put it on Airbnb, just make some spare income so I can actually afford living here. Another trend that we've seen a lot with home buyers is actually, and it's also how we got started in the business, is utilizing ADUs, you know, additional dwelling units, as income-producing on-property short-term rentals, Airbnbs. Uh, as a way to offset even you know some of the houses people were purchasing or some of their kind of oh maybe even house hacking is a good way to put it so really it, it started off with spare bedrooms evolved into kind of adus or like apartments within single family homes uh and then you know demand started growing and you know the uh, as travelers started coming to we're based in charlotte people started coming to charlotte 
they realized, hey, it would be much cooler for me to stay at this Airbnb in this popular neighborhood that's not too touristy, that where all the real good food is, where all the locals hang out, and rent a room there or rent an ADU there, a tiny house or, you know, a garage apartment instead of go at a stuffy hotel in, you know, in, in downtown where there's really not much to do because it's really just like business, right, in downtown Charlotte or uptown as we call it here. So we started to see a lot of demand for those type of accommodations. And that over time has evolved from your spare bedroom to your ADU to now, uh, you know, a home that may have been a long-term rental prior transitioning to a short-term rental or people acquiring properties for the strict purpose of turning them into short-term rentals because they believe they could generate them better returns than traditional long-term rentals. So it's really been an evolution of, you know, taking an existing business model, which were vacation rentals, and taking them from, you know, vacation destinations to more urban markets. Then, you know, within those urban markets started off with, you know, mattresses on the floor to spare bedrooms, to ADUs, to, um, you know, transitioning long-term rentals to short-term rentals to then, um, you know, really purpose-built now short-term rental communities in, in, uh, in, in urban markets. And now we added another component to that, right? We, we um, added midterm rentals. Correct. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. 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 Happy. So it was really interesting. So to kind of go back to your point of COVID. So, you know, and I'll, I'll throw some data points in here too, because I think it'll be helpful for the kind of the industry to understand. And so we as Rabu have been operating as a property manager for about four and a half years. So we've kind of seen short-term rentals go through quite a, quite a bit of a, change over that time um, and what happened to us was so we had about 70 properties that were operating in in 2019 and beginning of 22 tw- sorry beginning of 2020 and you know we were doing well people were staying for an average of two and a half days across a portfolio and then covid happened and overnight you know airbnb put in a policy that said hey if you have any future bookings between i think it's like actually i remember now I think about it, it was Friday, March 13th, so Friday the 13th in March, where they said, hey, we're going to cancel any upcoming reservations that people have because, you know, the lockdown went into place. So overnight, 90% of our bookings just disappeared. And we understood why, we didn't, you know, cry wolf by any means. But at that same time period, in, in so think like Q, late Q1, early Q2 of 2020, a lot of Airbnbs disappeared because there wasn't demand for them. All of a sudden they went, I think their uh, inventory dropped by 15% um, because people just weren't going anywhere. People were stuck, um, stuck in place. Uh, people weren't going anywhere. We didn't, we didn't shut any of our business down. What we did at that time was actually transition our short-term rentals to midterm rentals, which is what you alluded to, Todd, basically monthly rentals. And you could only rent our properties for a few months at a time versus just a few days at a time. And we saw a huge influx of demand there. And what really happened at that time period was that, you know, it didn't look like the lockdown was going to come to an end anytime soon. So we started seeing people from, you know, northern cities like New York, Boston, Cleveland, where, you know, living in an apartment, you know, was not that great and you were really stuck in not, not, not a great environment, say, hey, for the same price, for half the price that I'm paying to stay at my rental in New York, I can move to Charlotte and stay at a furnished rental for a few months at a time. So that really took off at that time period. Now, the supply didn't change much between 2020 and 2021 because people were still kind of trying to figure out what the situation was, what the demand was. But as things started opening up again, People weren't traveling internationally just because of, you know, international lockdowns still being in place, but traveling to basically drive to destinations, anywhere where they can get into their car and drive to a particular market. So if you live in a city like Charlotte, you would drive to the mountains in Asheville or you drive to the beach in Wilmington, uh, really just places where you could drive to. Um, And the demand for this alternative accommodation, these short-term rentals skyrocketed at that time because people were ready to get out they wanted to go places um, and the market responded. And that's when more inventory came into place because of this demand is the revenue opportunity really. Yeah. And, and I guess along with that uh, came travel nurses, right? So, you know, um, we, we saw here locally in Baltimore, you know, a couple of inv- investors actually, you know, 
set up places specifically for that. You know, we have a lot of you know, very, um, very good hospitals, some of the best in the country here locally in Baltimore, and uh, that's turned out really well for one investor in particular. Um, so, I mean, are you seeing a lot of that still, or has that kind of cooled off? That that has been, you know, interestingly enough, that has been around for a while. I mean, there's dedicated websites that are just for travel nurses. So you hear about Airbnb, um, that and we definitely got travel nurses through channels like Airbnb. But uh, the primary channel for nurses, for example, was separate. It was, it was, a, it was a channel called Furnished Finder. This is where nurses go to find accommodations as their travel nurses. So that has the demand for that has been relatively flat for what it's worth over the last handful of years. Um, there was obviously some increase during the COVID times because of, you know, the unfortunate situations a lot of more urban markets were in because, due to the, the pandemic and needing as much support as they can get. Um, but that really has stuck around for a while. What, what has really changed more now is that the remote kind of work lifestyle has allowed people to live anywhere and work for a company. So, you know, even give you an example of us at Rabu, we used to have an office in Charlotte, North Carolina in a great part of town. We no longer have an office space. We have team members all over the country. Everybody's remote and a handful of them are just like hopping between cities, staying in different Airbnbs because that's the lifestyle they want to live there. You know, young, single or newly engaged. And they're like, okay, let's just go, you know, try out different places because the remote culture has been enabled by you know, Zoom meetings and everything associated with it. So there's a demand for this type of alternate accommodation um, and their the lifestyle for these individuals, not just, you know, your, you know, temporary housing situation. So Amir, you know, and, and I do, this is actually something that I want to talk about a little bit later, but, you know, um, we'll give them a little taste of it. What you're referring to is trending into a subscription-based you know, apartment lifestyle. And, you know, way before the pandemic, so I've been in commercial real estate for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And way prior to the pandemic, I was at a Internet of Things conference. It was a BOMA. I don't know if you're familiar with BOMA, Building mm -hmm. Owners and Managers Association. Okay. They had their annual, um, uh, you know, uh, convention in Nashville. And it was called the Internet of Things. In fact, I did a video on this not too long ago, a couple of weeks ago. And um, one of the things, and this is way before, this is 2017, I believe, certainly w way before the pandemic. And, you know, the WeWork office space was really kind of that whole model was booming, taking off, you know, like why? The, what was traditionally known as like a head down desk space, right? You need like 120 square feet per employee. So when you're helping people to, to determine how much office space they need with conference rooms, this, that, and whatever, then these models as companies were really downsizing. This has been a trend. This isn't mm -hmm. new. Companies were downsizing 10 years ago, right? Because of cost, sure. expenses, things like that. So that's why this you know, shared co-working space was taking off. Well, something that they were talking about back in 2017 was that transitioning into a, you know, a subscription-based lifestyle for us to rent and not own. And, you know, a lot of what we've done with our students in student housing across universities across the country is we've built these posh, very luxurious apartments, amenity-rich apartments, and we've kind of spoiled these people. In a lot of cases, these apartments that were pretty affordable, maybe it averaged 700 a person. I mean, you might sit there and go, wow, that's not affordable. But when you look at alternatives, right, they could have all of this amenity-based lifestyle. You know, the pool, the gym, the theater, the computer room, the everything, right? And then, so what they realized was that these young people are going to be graduating college. And, you know, if they can work remote, they could really, I mean, why have furniture? Why not just rent a furnished apartment anywhere, major cities around the country, live where you want, stay for a month. And there's a lot of companies that are doing that right now. They're, that's kind of coming back. And I, do, I said I didn't want to talk about it, and I just talked about it. But I'm going to get your opinion on that. Um, shortly as we dive in. And guys, this is a live show. You have a question for Amir? 
comment that question and we would love to hear from you. Uh, Melissa, anything before we go on? That we, we do wanna... have just a statement from Jeff M. Jeff, thank you so much. As always, everyone un wants to own a rental, short-term, long-term, it doesn't matter. People see TikTok videos nonstop about how you can have passive income and you don't have to work. Everyone wants it. Jeff M., we, we love you, man. We appreciate you always being on and uh, I know you, you follow a good buddy of mine, Travis, of Real Estate Mindset, and, and I think you know he's traveling. So, Travis, you're probably not watching us right now, but good luck, man, in your travels. He's going to be bringing us some updates on the road. He's, like, going to cities that are having major housing crashes and stuff. And Anyway, a little tangent. Uh, Amir, what do you say about what Jeff's comment is? Yeah, I mean, I think it's very fair, Jeff. I think the big thing, especially in real estate, there's no such thing as passive income, um, in my opinion. You know, there's property managers, and we 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 try as on the property management side of short-term rentals to say, hey, we provide you passive income. But transparently, I mean, passive income is incredibly hard in real estate. Um, it's just because of the nature of you know you're dealing with an actual real asset. Um, you know, and I think part of the problem that we're seeing. Uh, on the short-term rental side and some of this kind of, we might have heard about like the demand dropping Airbnb bust and all this stuff is because of these, uh, in my opinion, some of these TikTok influencers coming up with passive income and setting people up with false strategies that don't work. Short-term rentals, like anything, requires work, requires active investment of time and effort to actually be good at it. Uh, just putting something on Airbnb with, you know, cheap IKEA furniture um, is not going to get you the results you're looking for. It's going to cause, um, it's not going to make any money. It's not going to get you what you're looking for. So uh, I think we just need to be very careful with that because, um, you know, if it's on the internet, you probably uh, need to double and triple check uh, the source and, you know, the opportunity because the, in my opinion, especially in real estate, there's no such thing as passive income. Yeah, I applaud you on that, Amir and, and Jeff. We, again, thank you for your comment. But I applaud you on saying that because, you know, a lot of people and, you know, I'm, I'm getting ready to, we're, we're going to be publishing a video on Thursday on our channel. And it is going to be a very, very hot topic. Um, it is pertaining to uh, wholesaling. And, you know, these wholesalers are about to get whacked. Uh, the states are cracking down and changing legislation. But my point is, is that, you know, we are sold this bill of goods. And there usually is somebody's getting rich off the bill of goods. And the bill of goods is that we can just have money coming in, that money's easy. You don't have to work for it, you know, whatever. And you're, I applaud you on what you just said because, you know, passive is so subjective. Because I could tell you that right. people that are lying awake in bed at night because their tenants aren't paying their bills, I don't care whether they have a property manager or not, I would not call that passive income, right? I would not call that fun. Oh, I want to I want to get screwed by, you know, my tenant trashing my house. And whether I have a property manager or not, they're going to come and say, you need to write a check for $30,000 because, because your apartment got trashed. You know, I just, you know, I, I, I've never heard somebody say that, especially on my show. They've never come on and said, there really is, that, forget this passive income line. Uh, but usually the ones that are selling us these books and these CDs and, or wow, well, CDs, shows my age, these downloads, right? They're making money off of saying, hey guys, this is so easy. This is so easy. I wish I had a nickel for every wholesaler that went to a, went to a seminar and decided that they were going to buy lists, subscribe to, you know, these web, you know, sites to get data that they were going to send postcards out. <laughs> it's not expensive sending postcards out. It's like $5 to send. The postage is going up. It's not $5, but you get my point. You send out a thousand postcards, you just dump $500, $600, right? But anyway, thanks for saying that. Thanks, Jeff. What else do you have, Melissa? Yeah, we've got a couple more questions. Orlando Rodriguez, thank you so much for your question. Do you recommend renting your personal home while you're out traveling? Amir, what do you say about that? Uh, 
it depends on your personal appetite uh, of having strangers in your home. Um, you know, there's, uh, if you are okay with that, if you can set your home up to the point where you feel comfortable, something breaking or something gone missing or somebody not, or somebody going through personal stuff, then go for it because it, it can be done very well. We've done it, you know, my wife and I have done it plenty with our home. We've even done uh, this thing called home exchange where we say, hey, you know, we found people in Orlando and Austin who were saying, hey, you know, I'd love to go check out Charlotte so we just switch homes, right? We we went into their home for a couple of weeks and moved into ours. Uh, we knew what we were doing. We knew we had to have like an owner's closet and put all our stuff in it that we don't want people touching. But we went through like a, we had phone calls with them, got comfortable with them. Um, in this instance, but we put our home on Airbnb plenty of times and had really good success and they have helped us cover our trip. So um, if you are of that mindset, and that's a big kind of asterisk there, if you are okay with other people spending time in your home, if you're not there going through some of your stuff, and again, some of this you can put away yourself, then I'm in favor of it. We've done it and we do it again in a heartbeat, uh, but I know that's not for everyone. Um, so it's really a, more of a personal choice. It's never had real issues for what it's worth. Yep. Yeah. Orlando, thanks, man. We appreciate you always are on our show as well. Thank you so much for continually continuing to spend your Tuesday nights with us. And Orlando and has another question, too, that I think that this is also a really good one. I know it's two in a row for Orlando tonight, but we get the bonus he from him. He deserves it. He does. He deserves it. He deserves it. But um, pros and cons of short-term versus long-term rentals. I think that would be good to go over. First of all, let me say this. Um, a lot of times it is better to leave a property or have a property be a long-term rental and a short-term rental for various reasons. But I think like anything in real estate, it's it's location and property specific, right? Like you probably don't want to take a property in a uh, high-end subdivision that is full of, you know, established neighbors and be the first person in there to do a short-term rental and really price it low and just create issues there. So really it's it's specific to the location, to the market. In the right market, the pro of a short-term rental, very, you, can, you can definitely generate higher returns on your, on your asset. You can, you know, sometimes double and triple the revenue that you can generate there. So the, uh, the biggest pro is the, um, uh, the revenue. The second biggest pro is the flexibility. You can rent it out full time. You can rent it out part time, you know, use the asset yourself. Those are the two biggest revenue and flexibility cons. It's, you know, it's more active management than with, with long term, with long term rentals. There's also less, uh, consistency from a revenue perspective. So seasonality is very real in short-term rentals. You know, you always hear the story, hey, I put my property in a short-term rental, I made $10,000 last month, cool. It was also, you know, December in, 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 in you know, the Rock, Rocky Mountains, right? Perfect ski season, right? How much did that property make in June and July when nobody's coming? Oh, $800, right? It's, it's not, there's just no, it's much less consistency, right? You're not getting a, a, a flat monthly check every month. So really asset selection is the biggest thing, but more revenue for sure uh, for the right property, more flexibility for sure if you want that. Um, uh, this like would go to short-term rental lot, long-term rental lot, consistency, less active uh, management really. Um, yeah, I'd like to add a couple to that as well. Uh, you know, as far as on the cons side, uh, you know, you're furnishing an entire house. I mean, people don't realize, I mean, what's it, thirty, thirty-five thousand dollars you can spend easily on furnishing. I mean, if you have four bedrooms, let's just say, and one of the benefits of that people are looking for for Airbnbs is they want to be able to have more people, you know, in the same house. I mean, that's a lot of the benefit. So because I mean, they want to have their parties, their bachelorette parties, their trips, their, you know, they want to have, you know, three sets of families come and vacation together. So, you know, your your bedding is expensive, you know, towels are expensive. I mean, all these things, you're equipping a kitchen completely, right? I mean, think about it from a pizza cutter to an ice cream scooper, right? You don't, you cannot be without everything. Um, but I think the biggest con that I've seen is that finding the right cleaning company, they will bury you in reviews. So when you have a long-term rental, unless you're an apartment complex, 
you're not really you're probably not going to get reviews Right. I mean, people, they love you. They move out. They go down there. I mean, you're not like saying, hey, could you give me a review on my one house that I have, you know, in uh, my zip code or whatever. But believe me when I tell you, if the wrong cleaning company is not cleaning your place and they're leaving hairs, you know, in the bed or on the toilet seats and ah, let me tell you, that's the first thing that will ruin you. And that's kind of hard to get back. So that's just kind of my my two. Yeah, that, that, that's a great one. That's the cleaning and the kind of, um, what's the best way to put this, like the importance of every review and every day being perfect is the mo- is the hardest thing about the short-term rental business. Finding the right cleaner, when you find them, you know, stick around, like make sure you keep them happy. And, you know, that's what's creating a little bit of like the pushback on Airbnb. It's like, oh, I'd stay in Airbnb, but the cleaning fee is $150, $200. The reason that is, it's very rarely is cleaning a profit center for the owner, uh, unless they're doing themselves. And even then you can question if it's a profit center. It's the cost to have a really good cleaner in the property to get it done. Now, of course, some some hosts take it to extreme where they ask you to do the laundry and everything before you even leave and you still pay a high cleaning fee. But in many instances, you know, the cleaning fee covers the cost to the really good cleaner. And if you got you think, think about it, they're not coming in there or they shouldn't come in there and just like, make the beds and, you know, take a, does a couple of things. They really, they almost need to do a deep clean after every state to ensure that the next guest is happy and leaves a five-star review. And that just adds, that's expensive. And especially in this market, you know, if you can't find a cleaner under $30 an hour to do the cleanings, right? It's just, it's what it is. Um, so you have to, you have to pay that. And, you know, that gets passed down to the guests, which is where some of that pushback is coming from. But, you know, it's just part of the business. I have a good friend of mine that had, he sold them all, by the way, um, when the market, you know, really jacked up at the peak, he was like, wow, man, I'm just going to sell all of these uh, uh, properties and wait till the market crashes and then buy a whole nother set, right? Another round of properties. And, and, uh, so that's what he did. But, um, but he was saying that to your point, you may have a four bedroom house and you may only think that two people stayed in that one room. And it may be your, you know, tendency to think, well, you don't need to change the sheets on the three other beds, right? Or maybe you don't need to clean those rooms. You're exactly right, Amir. I mean, you have to sort of assume that every square inch of that place was lived in, right, during their stay, and you need to clean it from top to bottom. Anyway, so before we get started with any more questions, I want to jump in. And I want to talk about, because we, we're talking about all of these things, you know, you're, Amir, you said, man, this has been around for a long time. There's still a huge amount of people that don't know about it. But I tell you what, I see increasing legislation trying to shut it down, right? I, I see where we're, 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 we're seeing homeowner associations trying to shut it down. We're seeing condominium associations try, fighting to shut this down because it has grown from, you know, it's not just a vacation spot, right? It is. It has become, in every neighborhood, there's short-term rentals, it seems like, and they're party centrals, man. It's like parties every weekend. And, you know, people have their Thanksgiving dinners there instead of messing up their own houses. And, you know, and, and now I just read an article that Airbnb and um, VRBO are actually trying to use this algorithm or this tracker to track who's going to rent or, you know, will have the propensity to want to rent a place for the Super Bowl. Right, to throw their Super Bowl party, so they're actually going to try and track these people and shut them down, prevent them from renting an Airbnb for Super Bowl party. But let's talk about that because I'll give you an idea here. In Baltimore City, right, they passed a law a couple years ago that said you can't have an Airbnb unless. You live there, unless it's your primary residence. They closed that loophole, right? Baltimore County, you know, when I had inquired um, about 
the changing. I'm always asking in our markets what's coming down the pike. And Baltimore County had indicated, hey, we're getting ready to do the same thing as Baltimore City. Philadelphia just announced January 1, right? I don't know if you know about this one, but Feb, uh, January 1, Philadelphia has said that, hey, you have to have specific licenses for these short-term rentals. And if you don't live there, you have to have a hotel license. So where's the future with this short-term rental business? I mean, it's almost like the internet, right? When the internet first came out, people weren't paying sales tax. They were buying things <laughs> deliberately online. Mm -hmm. you know, now these people are renting houses. They don't have to pay hotel tax. Now they will. What's going to happen with that? Yeah, great question. So just real quick, we actually, our second Airbnb that we had was actually in Baltimore um, for what it's worth. So it started in Charlotte. And the, way, the reason we had it in Baltimore was because my parents bought a row house in a uh, Greek town uh, in mm -hmm. Baltimore and yep. turned a basement into an Airbnb and helped them. So it, it was legal by, by regulatory standards in, in Baltimore, but it helped them, you know, basically live there with very limited uh, liability, right? Because they, they had, uh, you know, they were making short-term rental income. We, as a company, are pro-regulations. Uh, uh, our belief is that short-term rentals are, a can be can be an, an addition to a neighborhood to an area can actually enable a kind of evolving lifestyle especially as we talk about but you know the remote lifestyle that's kind of that COVID didn't create it accelerated it really we're we're all about making sure that it's done um legally and, and responsibly and we are also pro eliminating hosts that are just doing it for the buck and you know, we'll utilize strategies. We've come across owners who have, you know, bought a house and put in, in a, you know, 20 by 20 room, put in six uh, queen bunk beds just so they can get the most heads in beds and taking actions that are really in, uh, calling for unruly behavior at those properties, right? But Amir, um, you know, if I could just interject here, but, why yeah, would please. they? Why wouldn't they? I mean, you know, and, and with, I mean, and I'm, I'm just being, you know, asking the question, you say the people that are just doing it for the buck, why in the world would you do it if you weren't doing it for the buck? Just to feel good? I mean, of course you're doing it for the buck, but, uh, you know, the strategy being, let me be a, okay with being a nuisance to the area just for the buck, right? I think it right. can be and should so be done responsibly. Schmuck, not, not for the buck, right. but doing it because they're being a schmuck about it, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And like I mentioned, like you want to have, you know, six people sleep in one, or I guess 12 people. You have, you know, six, uh, three, you know, bunk beds. They're all queens. Um, like it, you're just asking for trouble. So we are pro-regulation, pro-responsible renting. Um, and even in urban markets, because there is this demand for this new alternative lifestyle, as you mentioned, apartment communities are picking it up. There's a need for that on the single family side and this kind of alternative accommodation side. But it has to be done responsibly. You know, the stories that you hear about, you know, people throwing parties, causing havoc, the shootings happening in the Airbnb. Of course, they're true, but they're a very small minority of what happens at our prop at, at properties we've hosted. Man, out of 30 plus thousand people at our properties have had maybe a handful of incidents of actually things happening. And at that point, the guests, you know, misrepresent themselves and it happens and we went above and beyond of doing it. Sometimes transparently even firing the owner, firing the property, just because we realized this wasn't the right match for the, for, for the area the neighborhood and it attracted the wrong crowd that was creating issues for the neighborhood. So I think what we will see over the next, it's going to take a while just because it's government and regulations. You're going to see a, a, a little bit of like a, correction on what is considered kind of standard and normal for short-term rentals. And you're going to see a lot more like curated communities for short-term rentals uh, in curated areas, whether that's done through hotel licensing, new kind of special zoning for short-term rentals, things of that nature. I think we're going to see that in the future. There's, you know, we know of developers now that are building townhome communities 
that purposefully are built so that, that allow you to turn those into short-term rentals, that written HOAs that allow you to do that. Um, we have purpose-built single-family communities that are all short-term rentals in, in urban markets like Charlotte. So it's happening. I think we're just going to see a professionalization of it, right, versus anybody being able to, you know, take a house and put it in an Airbnb uh, and invite trouble. I think we are going to see some of that positive regulation that's going to, you know, create a more standardized experience for everyone involved. And I think that's what's going to happen to this asset class because I don't see the demand going anywhere. People have tasted what it's like to stay in an Airbnb or a short-term rental versus a hotel. And there's some significant advantages to that. Um, you know, we've had countless of stories being uh, from people that have stayed at properties, being extremely grateful, whether they're travel nurses or, you know, next to hospitals, people that are there contending for um, a, a sick family member and just wanting to come back to a hotel, uh, to a house and make dinner and just like, you know, listen to music and like, relax and get out of the stressful environment they're in that this type of asset allows and we're going to keep seeing more of that kind of situation hey, pop up you know and i agree i mean look there's a lot i think there's a lot of benefit if if anyone has done a lot of traveling and you're not a big party or drinker right uh, what do you do when you go to the hotel right I, you end up just sitting in your room now, I'm not talking about when you're going yeah. vacation, going to the beach, and you can pop the umbrella up and, you know, go in the water and whatever. I'm talking about if you're traveling, uh, like you said, you need to go, you know, visit family. Uh, you're going to, a, you know, a graduation and, or a family reunion or something. It, there's a lot of benefit to feeling like you're in, ho in a home. You don't have to just sit in the bedroom, Right, like yeah. you would at a hotel. You're not going to go down to the lobby and be like, "Oh, let me just say hi to everybody walking by." I mean, come on, man, it's a right. weird feeling, yeah. right? So For I sure. get that. Uh, yeah, let's talk about because as we get into as we get into more and what I really want to dive into here is that, and I know many people that are doing this short-term rental business. And, you know, I hear the horrors, uh, the, the stories that, um, you know, because, you know, we don't hear about the bad stuff, right? We hear about, oh, this is great from especially sites like Airbnb, for example, um, that says that they check everybody's identity, that they do such a great job of blah, 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 blah. That's a bunch of crap, right? I mean, they are very, I mean, there's very little that someone has to do to open up an Airbnb account. And the biggest problem that I've heard is that people book Airbnbs and they're not even the ones staying there because no one's there to check them in a lot of times, right? You just go about your business and you don't know anything about these people. So, you know, how do you know who's staying in your, actually staying in your house? And, you know, and then, and then, guys, I, I want to talk about something even bigger than that. How do you kick them out if they decide that they just want to stay and squat? You know, like maybe, Amir, you know the different laws. Can you just call the police and say these people are unlawfully in my house? What is the days of stay in various areas that constitutes that? What kind of squatters? You know, how does this bring about squatters? But let's talk about the issue first about... How do you know who's staying in your house? Yeah, great question. So I, I will, big picture wise, I will give Airbnb credit compared to other websites like VRBO uh, and Booking.com. They actually do a much better job of verifying the guest identity. We've had, transparently, they do a much better job than anybody else. Um, so I, I will give them credit. And we could always do better and they obviously want to, Creep the uh, the hurdle low ish because they their their job is to generate bookings. That's how they generate re revenue. But they do do a better job than most but, anybody else. But um, they're serving the guests, not the host. Their primary, I, and I'll argue that one right there. If, if they tell you that they're for the host, that's not true. Yeah, you won't get an argument from me on that, and um, no argument on me on that end. Um, that's that's how they generate most of their money, of course. Um, so uh, that they do a, a, a okay, a good job, especially compared to everybody else. They do a much better job. 
Now, we as the operator ourselves, we put in numerous other kind of security steps to make sure that one, the person is the person who is staying at the property. Uh, and two, and then once they get to the property that we're not seeing any unusual activity that we would not be a fan of. So uh, with regards to before they even check in, uh, we ask them to um, send a photo ID, uh, go through a verification process and take a picture of themselves next to their photo ID, right? Uh, at which point you can see, okay, that's, that's that's Ben Davis. Ben Davis matches his driver's license. The face matches that. And then we have him do like a um, verification where they then give us the credit card. Their credit card is like a deposit to hold. So then we make sure that that checks out with the ID that checks out with the uh, with the photo that's included. So that's one of the systems that we put into place. Uh, then beyond that is honestly controlling access. So uh, we how do you get their number? How do you get their number? Are you just number? using the Airbnb app through this? Because, you know, is that how it's done? Because Airbnb wants you to text everything through the app. Yeah, through, yeah you get the app. You get the phone number through the app. And there's a lot of automated communication that you can do on top of that. The next thing is we have a lot of smart home devices in the property since it's a requirement for anybody who works with us, starting with a lock that gets programmed to only work when you, for you when you're supposed to be there. And it's the last footage of phone number noise monitoring to, so we know when there's, you know, certain decibel levels have been exceeded in the property. So we can tell the guests, hey, you know, we're noticing. It's pretty loud in there, please reduce your noise. Um, CO2 detectors that let us know if there's any kind of like smoking or anything happening on premise. Um, and based on that, the agreement that they've signed with us, we can remove their access from the property if they violate any of that, which then uh, allows us to call the police and take whatever steps we need to take to get that person removed. The good thing is we can also just take access away from them as well by changing the lock code on the property. So now they no longer have access to the property themselves if we start seeing behavior there. So uh, it's taken a while, but the way we operate, we've built a pretty significant kind of security checkpoint list for us both mm -hmm. prior and then during the actual guests staying at the property. Now, Obviously, can't guarantee that everybody does that, but we've learned from first-hand experience because there's been, you know, there's been, as you can imagine, um, utilizing Airbnb and Verbo, there's been quite a bit of, like, scams happening of people booking and then canceling last minute, but you've already shared the check-in instructions with them, so now they have the access code to your property and can get in there. Um, we've circumvented that with some of the measures that I just mentioned that we put into place because if you don't have an actual reservation, your code doesn't work, and it's something that you know, creates a lot of security uh, barriers for for activity we wouldn't want to see there. So how do you handle the people that aren't who they said they were when they booked it? I mean, that happens a lot. I mean, I you know, you just deny them access? We deny them access, exactly right. Uh, we, yeah. uh, we deny them access. We, we report them. We, you know, depending on how they book, we have to report them to the, you know, website, Airbnb or whatever and say, hey, it's proof that this is not the right person they, they gets canceled um but meanwhile your calendar was booked out for that period of time and you had no revenue now right or did they have to pay anyway the, uh, so they have to pay anyway and we we make this a requirement very quickly upon actually confirming a reservation so we don't allow that to be a barrier for us we don't wait until the last minute if you don't do it within a certain time period then your your reservation is void basically yeah. So Before we that, take that the, eliminates a lot of, yeah, I was gonna say that those type of sensors eliminate a lot of bad bad apples. They see that and they kind of jump um, and go elsewhere. Yeah. Before we take some questions here, how do you deal with squatters? Do you deal with that much? I mean, do you have make you know here a lot of times, <laughs> um, you know, there are agents that believe that in you know putting a sign for sale even on a vacant property can invite somebody to say hey you know this house is for sale i wonder if it's occupied and then you know we have squatters right and squatters rights where if somebody goes into the home and kind of moves in takes up residency there you just can't throw them out um you know i hear a lot of people that that worry about this um you know how do you how does the law address that and maybe you can specifically talk about maryland since you have one down in uh baltimore city um what are the 
the laws with that. You know, is there a certain amount of days that after they book that amount of days, then it goes into just like their rental tenants, the same as a long-term tenant that have squatter's rights that you have to go through the eviction process? Or when can you actually call the police and say, hey, look, we're a hotel. Maybe you may even be paying hotel taxes. We're a hotel, and these people are here illegally. Eject them. Yeah, it really varies state by state and the, the rules accordingly. Like I know California is one that's especially tight, right? I think in California, if you have access to a property for, I think more, and I could be wrong here, so I apologize if I'm wrong, but it's like, it's as little as 30 days, you basically have squatter protection rights, right? So, you know, and like in, in places like that, you would set your maximum stay length to be under that, that level, at which point the squatter rights kick in. Um, so it's a strategic decision you have to make early on and do your diligence. And again, I don't remember what it is for Baltimore, but a lot of places there, it's, you know, a couple of months, three months, I think is more, the most common. Um, but you have to strategically set your kind of booking window and length of stay to a time period where if they, you know, if there are requirements by a day, you can get them removed by the local authorities, uh, especially if you have the proper kind of, uh, which you should, the proper kind of either uh, booking information from the Airbnb, Airbnb one of the booking sites or if they book directly with you, if you have like a uh, rental agreement with them in place, you can you can make that happen. So again, it's the responsibility of the, uh, of the homeowner we, or the operator. We have never had any squatters knock on wood in our properties. Now we've seen it with other operators, especially in California. It's a bigger deal because of the low uh, minimum day count um for that was to kick into effect uh but it's just again an awareness thing again it's not passive uh to go yeah. back to the point earlier yeah yeah so it's always you know it's always a concern i mean i know that here i mean we just went through uh, actually uh, in the last several months we've had to help clients assist them through the eviction process uh, to get the house ready to sell because right as you can imagine, <laughs> with the moratoriums and the um, uh, what we just went through, uh, a lot of landlords it had a really bad experience. And when they finally were able to get the tenants out, they said, that's it, <laughs> enough. I don't want this anymore. Let's sell these properties. But on average here, and I know, you know people may argue locally that they did it quicker, but on average, it takes like seven months to get somebody here in Maryland actually out. You know, by the time of, you know, redemption rights and if they pay you and kind of drag things out or before you can actually, you know, say, I don't want your money anymore. I just want you gone, uh, you know, out of the house and even for just not paying, period. And I know like now it's winter time, and, you know, I mean, eviction is a terrible thing. Believe me, I don't care what anybody's situation or who may say that they deserve it or not. It's awful. And, you know, my heart always goes out to these people that are being displaced. But the, the thing is, is that, you know, the sheriff won't evict if it's like below freezing, if it's precipitating, if it's doing, you know, so then it kind of starts things again. And so there are ways that tenants can drag it out. Melissa. Mm hmm. So first, uh, before we get into a question, I know you guys have made some comments about what you are seeing locally in your neck of the woods. John, thank you so much for this comment. My HOA has banned Airbnbs in central Washington state. So exactly what we had talked about earlier. Yeah. Yeah, and then, I would say our kind of ground rule for what it's yeah. worth is if there's an HOA, don't even think about considering short term rentals there. The only, you know, couple of trends just real quick there, Melissa, that mm -hmm. we're seeing is, uh, I mentioned this earlier, there's now new developments that have HOAs that are allowing this purposefully. Um, so uh, that's one case. The other case where, again, not saying you should do this, but there's use cases where, or the situation just makes sense. Sometimes the HOAs don't allow anything less than 30 days, at which point monthly rentals could make sense. Um, and you would be within your bounds to do that. Um, because, you know, those are more of the kind of le less of the transient state types. So those are sometimes opportunities. But again, you have to make sure that that's the best use for your asset and that 
it still would not create issues with with your HOA. But for the most part, we've had no issues with monthly rentals across our portfolio. We have entire markets like Richmond and uh, uh, Asheville that are just monthly rentals, um, and no complaints from anybody ever involved. But usually, HOAs uh, are not a good place to look into short-term rentals, um, unless yeah, it's always a risk. Even if there's nothing in the HOA that says short-term rentals are allowed or are not allowed, um, we would usually tell people not to engage or think about short-term rentals there just because of the opportunity for that to change as well. Mm -hmm. And then we have Kelly Kell, again, area specific. Prices are being slashed on Airbnbs in Florida. I think the market is just totally saturated. Another viewer asked her for purchase or rent. She went on to say to rent them. I just looked up in my city of St. Augustine, Tons of vacancy and prices are literally marked way down. Yeah, I think good stuff. A um, cu- couple things to think through, um, you know, and we, and we can look at, say, St. Augustine specifically. Uh, it's it's all about seasonality. And that's the one thing that people don't give enough credit in the short-term rental space. St. Augustine, this time of year, I'm, I'm not sure. I'd have to look at the data to tell you, okay, is this a high seasonal month? Or is it not? But um Again, like that, that varies throughout the year. And that could be an oversupply of properties. That kind of goes back to what we talked about earlier. A lot of people thinking that short-term rentals are easy to do. Um, you know, what we in the industry do that I've done a lot is when we do kind of underwriting for short-term rentals, we don't underwrite to like performance data from 2020 or 2021 or even 2022 because we think those are overcorrections of the market because of what happened with COVID. We do most of our underwriting to 2019 during normal times, like stabilized times in a sense. Um, And between those two years, we really are not seeing much of a drop off. We are just now are close to having regained the amount of supply that there was in 2019 because of so much of it uh, dropped off in the COVID, the first few COVID years. It's recovered now, but just now as it recovered Occupancy is actually up now compared to 2019. Uh, nightly rates are up by 30% compared to 2019. Revenue is up uh, compared to 2019. Um, but you know, people that are looking into short-term rents as a true asset class aren't looking as much into 2021 uh, and 2022 data because we don't believe that was the normal. We believe that was the correction. Um, and that's what we, when we work with uh, buyers, that's what we underwrite against 2019 data and future looking data as well. So Amir, and before we jump off of this one, and uh, Kelly, thank you so much for that. Um, and to Kelly's point, um, our friend Dana, right, who has Hemlane, mm-hmm. they're big, they uh, aggregate a lot of data and information as I'm sure you do as well. Um, but uh, she had just published uh, a post that said that inventory and I, 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 it's in our show, show notes here, but inventory, I think the number was 41% up. Does that sound right? Over a year, uh, the amount of added Airbnb inventory in the last year alone, which would kind of go along with that market, that market saturation that Kelly's referring to, you know, how do, I mean, first of all, you know, and, and this is always my question, and Amir, I, I love you, man. You're doing a great job and giving us wonderful information. And, I'm, you know, I'm not being difficult. I'm just trying to, you know, challenge a little bit and say, you know, what, you know, with the economy the way that it is and people not having money to travel. I mean, I know I talk to a lot of people. I think the... Airbnb market or short-term rental market, in my opinion, is more of a younger person's kind of go-to uh, because a lot of older people just don't know about it yet, right? But they're the ones that are impacted the most financially. I know specifically some of my friends' kids are don't even want to go away to bridal, what do you call them, um, bachelor, bachelorette parties, because of the costs of traveling and the cost of staying in places. I mean, they don't have enough money to buy groceries for crying out loud. So with all of these 
new Airbnbs coming on the market, who's going to rent them? Yeah, so let's talk the numbers real quick. Uh, I love this question. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're asking it because I think it's, it's good for, for us to talk about it. Uh, in 2019, there was about 1.2 million Airbnb short-term rentals in the United States. So 2019, as I mentioned just a little bit ago, that was kind of like the last kind of stabilized year, 2019. Now you was. said Airbnb. Is that collective yeah. or is that just on that platform? Is that all short-term rentals? All, all short-term rentals. So uh, what you okay. see is most short-term rentals are on Airbnb or on Verbo or on other places. Some some are more specific to markets, right? But they're mostly kind of between those two. There's, so it's about mm -hmm. 1.2 million in 2019. In 2020, that dropped to a little bit over a million. Um, so it was about 1.2, 1.3. Sorry, one, yeah, so it was 1.2 million in 2019. In 2020, it was about 1, 1 million, like 40, 50,000. Um, in 2021, it was 1 million, 60,000. So the inventory even only up to 20, by 20,000. Now, last year in, in 2022, it jumped up to 1.25. So basically back to it was in 2019. So it is about a 20% jump in the last year. Uh, of inventory from 2021 to 2022, um, but it's still very much back closer to what it was in 2019 than it was prior. Now, the occupancy rate between now and 2019 is actually up 5%. So people, these properties are more occupied and people are also paying $60 more per night than they were paying back then. So in general, people are making more money now on short-term rentals than they were making in 2019 and staying at them more. Now, of course, inflation has a lot to do with that. Everything costs more. As you were joking around earlier at the grocery store, I have three boys who taking them to the grocery store, feeding the house now. <laughs> Man, that's, it's, it's, a, it's, it's painful. Um, one thing, so one thing we're still seeing from a demand perspective, it's a combination of people are still going to drive to destinations. Um, they're still driving places. Um, there's still plenty of that happening. But the one thing that we did not have in 20. 20 and 2021 and started returning in 2022 was international travel international people coming from other countries coming to the united states to visit now that kind of the air travels back open up again um so we're seeing that kind of influx of international travelers come into the states to stay at these airbnb um so really it's it was very heavy on domestic travel that that, that appears to have subsided some but we have seen uh, international travel come in um, to help offset that. Now, again, you know, year over year, occupancy is down 2% compared to what it was in 2021. Um, but as I mentioned, we don't underwrite to that data just because we don't believe that's reflective of the market going forward. Um, does that make sense? It does. No, I, I, I think it's wonderful. I mean, you laid it out uh, perfect. Uh, and, uh, you know, it sounds like you know the data. What do you think is going to happen moving forward? Um, do you believe that? <laughs> do you believe that the economy is going to uh, get worse before it gets better? I mean, do you, you know, where where is your head? I mean, you're invested. You have this platform. You're growing. It's dependent upon. I think you make your money based on you know the the hosts making their money. Um, so a lot of what you're predicated on, you know, your your success is predicated on their success, which I like that. I like that model. Okay, but you know, you're a smart guy, right? What? But you're also, and this isn't, you know, knocking you, but you're younger than I am. Uh, you know, you haven't seen what I've seen in business, right? You haven't seen the downturns yet, right? Um, I, I, you know, it's been great since. 2012, 2013, we've been on this upward trend despite a little bit of hiccups. We've printed more money than we ever have here in the U.S. in the last couple of years. We've stimulated this economy and artificially inflated things, in my opinion, um, to find out that now, despite our, all of that stimulus and artificial, you know, you know, feel good, you know, the economy, things are great, but the stock market, everything was booming. Now we find find out that we have less money in our bank accounts than we did before we were given money, right? And where do you think things are going to go? I mean, everything we're saying here is, you know, positive trend. 
people are buying these Airbnbs. Occupancy rates are up. We're, you know, it seems like things are going well. What do you think is going to happen in the next 12 months? Yeah, great question. Uh, yeah, I'll date myself. I graduated in 2008 from college uh, and uh, within like got a job within six months, I was laid off because of what happened in 2008. So I've seen a lot of that and I was, I was unemployed for, for a number of months before landing my feet and figuring it out. Um, I think the uh, one of the uh, things that we're going to see is we're going to definitely going to see um, a continued rise in the number of listings of short-term rentals. Uh, but I think we're also going to see um, uh, a more of those dropping off over time, just because I think, you know, people are going to realize that it's not a get rich quick scheme. It's just not, I mean, it just is what it is. I think there's definitely continued demand for this, you know, Airbnb and their data is showing that their demand is growing 20% year over year. Um, but the, the, the supply has to be done the right way, has to be professional. So I think what we're going to see over time is that the the good operators, the good properties are going to continue to perform well because there will be demand for them. The ones that are just, you know, buying a place or renting a place and throwing an Airbnb with, you know, you know lipstick on a pig as a rental, right, uh, are going to suffer in these times. Uh, the great thing about short-term rentals is the flexibility of them. They can serve multiple purposes. I mentioned what happened um, with uh you know covid when you know people stopped traveling we were able to transition into a different asset usage type um so the flexibility as i even alluded to uh to the question earlier is what makes it a powerful property type to have um so from everything we've seen is that the good properties like most things in real estate are going to continue to perform well the ones that have not been set up for success are going to struggle and probably going to disappear. And the whole asset class and I consider short term rentals an asset class is going to be professionalized and, you know, going to continue to have a place in the, in the, in the lifestyle of people. And in the economy. Um, it's just that, you know, I think the other thing is worth mentioning is that a lot of people got into short term rentals by watching TikTok videos and hearing about making 20% cash on cash returns and just these, outlandish numbers, um, which can be done if you're lucky. I think people are going to realize that while this asset class can perform better, it's not, um, you know, going to get you a 20% cash and cash return on everything. You can get good returns, better returns than maybe as long-term rentals, but you're going to see some of that kind of expectation setting come down and become more normalized, again, more professionalized. I think that's what we'll see over the next 12 18, you know, even 36 months of the properization of this asset class. Do you think rents demand. are coming down? I, I think, well, it's hard to think about rents coming down in this, in the market that we're in, where everything is, is in, in, inflation is happening, right? Everything costs more. So I don't know that rents will come down. Um, I think um, the return profile will come down some, right? Um, for somebody who's buying this as an investment type um, because it will cost more to buy the asset on all levels, right? Um, but I don't think the rents will come come down just because, you know, everything is becoming is, is more expensive now. So I don't think that's going to change. Yeah. And we have no data that shows us that, you know, we've seen rents go up. Uh, again, we mentioned it was about 200, in the low 200s in 2019. Now it's in the, uh, high 200s um, average daily rate that everybody's paying to stay at the property. So we're not seeing that come up, but that's not unsurprising in, in these times. Yeah. Melissa, you want to? Yeah, I do. How take about some questions? this one? We've got Jeff M again. What type of Airbnb do you see staying strong during an economic downturn? For Great example, question. coastal cities, Midwest, rural, et cetera. What do you think, Amir? I think what we've seen in this COVID was a good example for this a drive to destinations. So like anything that's within a drive, drivable location of large metropolitan areas that provides any kind of unique experience, whether it's resort towns, mount, you know, mountain towns, beach towns, anything that's a drive to destination is going to perform well because people can get in the car and, you know, feel it's more affordable to go to those places by driving there versus flying there and making a big ordeal. Um, so historically speaking, from everything we've seen, it's always the drive to destinations that, that perform well. So um, 
you know, and again, there can there could be various things. It could be like a dude ranch that somebody has in the middle of, you know, Virginia, or it could be a beach house in Myrtle Beach, or, you know, whatever the case may be. It can be, it can have various forms, but as long as you're within a drivable destination, um, it makes sense. You know, one, to go back to that, one of the markets that we have that we've seen a drop off from, that we've seen the biggest drop off from 21 to 2022 is actually Miami. Uh, and Miami is very much a fly to destination, right? Like even if you live in Florida, it can be a a 10 hour car ride to get down to Miami. It's very much a fly to market. Uh, and we've seen definitely our, the biggest drop that we have across our portfolio. One of the few places where uh, occupancy has dropped um, is in Miami because it, of it being more of that fly to destination. So drive to destinations are definitely uh, the, the, the best bet that we've seen historically speaking. Hmm. How about um, talking about, you know, the current situation, the current housing market, considering the current housing market, inflation and the downtrend in Airbnb, is it a good time to jump into the Airbnb market or should I wait for the market to rebound? Uh, I think it's always a good time to jump into the market if you find the right property that has the right return portfolio, right? Um, If you can find a property that uh, gets you the returns you're looking for based on the current market or in our end, based on 2019 data, um, then we, we would we would highly encourage that. Um, again, if you can find the right property, that can be a challenge these days with everything going on with the inventory um, that's happening in the market, the supply issues that we're having. Um, but um, we, we, uh, we're seeing plenty of activity of people buying assets right now because they believe in in the market uh, and it really didn't again depends for, on you what your strategy is as an investor are you looking for cash flow only are you looking for you know a long-term appreciation what what strategy are you hoping to achieve uh, your returns through and you know based on that uh, you need to make a decision if it's pure cash flow it might be harder now but if it's appreciation uh, and you can leverage short-term rentals to optimize your cash flow and you find the right asset then that could make a lot of sense Amir, I have a little segue into that since we're actually talking about the business of, you know, owning Airbnbs here. Um, you know, uh, there are, and, and we're having this conversation with a lot of just, you know, straight up real estate investors in general, right? Because uh, people that want to buy even long-term rentals, you know, they have in their mind that there, there's this 1% rule, uh, which, you know, I love, by the way, I mean, you know, that, you know, it's an easy one to figure out all in everything, buy the property, renovate the property, um, all cost in. If you can, you know, for simple math, if it's, you're all in at 200 grand, if you can rent it for $2,000 a month, chances are you're going to make some money, right? And I'm not talking about, you know, you're not getting rich, but then comes the second, you know, uh, short sort of shot right to the investment is hopefully you get appreciation right now. I think we've kind of peaked at the top of the market. I think there are better days coming for buying real estate. Um, you know, it always seems to go up, but I think what comes up, comes down It adjusts, it flattens out. It, it, it corrects, uh, especially after the exuberance that we just witnessed. Uh, but more specifically, when we're talking to investors right now, we get into, like what else can you do that are tax benefits or savings? And I'm not an accountant and I don't believe you are either. And, uh, uh, so guys don't take our advice on as tax advice. Uh, but I do know that there are strategies that we talk about and we connect people with. And there's things like advanced cost segregation, you know, where, you know, there's another way of actually, if you're in a position where you pay taxes, um, you know, and um, you can, you know, Typically, you buy a rental property, you can depreciate that structure, that building, that house, not the land, but the house portion of it over 27 and a half years. And basically what happens, I know that's slightly different with short-term rentals, but again, check with your own accountant. But let's just go off the premise of 27 and a half years. When you're doing advanced cost segregation, you might say that things like appliances or carpet and things like that aren't going to last 27 and a half years. So there's a, you know, a, a rule, you know, uh, that allows you to appreciate or advance the, accelerate the depreciation of these items. 
And there are companies out there that do a great job. But when we're talking about short-term rentals, we're kind of getting into like some different types of stuff, right? How do you know, and I know you're not an accountant, but just, you know, you're an operator. um, So you deal with this yourself. How do you deal with furniture? How do you deal with things like plates? Because you're buying it with after-tax money. And, you know, I mean, right? I mean, you're going out, you're buying these you know, um, necessities for your short-term rental property. How do you take those? How are they allowed to be depreciated? Are they instant? Yeah, transparently, I don't know all the details of that, nor am I in a position to speak on it. As I mentioned, I'm not an accountant. I do know that uh, the owners that we work with uh, oftentimes do, you know, utilize those are expenses that they incur during the kind of business process of of building up their short-term rental portfolio, their short-term rental business. Um, Again, I'm not a hundred percent sure how, the, how how those are utilized and how they depreciate it. Uh, well, you in do you own terms. Airbnb or short-term rentals yourself? As as an LP, yes, I do. Uh, no, I mean, in, in or, and I mean, you're just not comfortable sharing how you handle it. I mean, what do you do with your dishes and your plates in the and, in the LP structure? It's not something we we deal with uh, in that end. Uh, but uh, when we've you know in the homes that we bought, any time we've set up units. You know, we've, we've, we've depreciate the assets. Um, again, transparently, I don't remember in, in yeah. what, what manner we did, but we very much did, did do it. But again, I, I do not recall transparently. Yeah, sure. No problem. Let's, uh, let's take a couple more questions. It's getting late, guys. We're going to be wrapping it up real soon. We want to be respectful for Amir's time. And Melissa, I still have probably, I don't know, at least two more hours of work to do after the show. <laughs> I actually, I got, whether, you know, to contrary to popular belief, I actually sell real estate. So <laughs> I have clients that are expecting me to do things for tomorrow even. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, fortunately, thank God I'm blessed with, uh, having business right now. So uh, yeah. I'm grateful for that. I'm not complaining, but I still, uh, I'm actually, an active real estate broker selling property. Yes. We've got, I, I know this is profitability is always the question when you go into an Airbnb. So is, is it still profitable for you to rent out an Airbnb? Probably what is realistic percentage wise of profitability that someone should expect when they go in here? Obviously there's many variables. There's many variables. Are you self-managing? Are you, did you hire a property manager? Um, you know, are you, are you buying an asset that is already furnished? Are you furnishing it yourself? There's a lot of aspects that you you can look into. You know, if you look at it from just like, let's say I'm coming in um, as an investor looking to buy an asset, I think getting, you know, a, a high single digit, low double digit kind of cash on cash return is very much a real possibility, even in this environment, even with these interest rates. So. Uh, yes, it is profitable, but again, it's not every property and we wouldn't recommend every property to be turned into an Airbnb. And that's why, you know, doing the diligence and looking at the data and understanding the HOA rules and the shape and the condition of the property is, is equally as important. So, uh, yes, it can be profitable. There are companies out there that, uh, have a model of like rental arbitrage where it's similar to the WeWork model, Todd, you mentioned earlier, where they will rent will go to an apartment building and say, let me rent this property for you, from you, with your permission to turn into an Airbnb. They'll furnish them through everything. And those groups, you know, in general, make a 20% margin, even while going that route after all their costs, which includes, you know, utilities and things of that nature. But so, yes, it's profitable, but you have to do your diligence on identifying the sure. asset. They're taking the wholesale approach, and that has been popular in office space. Yeah, yeah, I'll come in, I'll rent your whole floor at a discounted rate. And by the way, these one or two offices that you have, let's move them up and down or whatever. Get them out of here. Give us the space. We're going to guarantee you X amount of dollars and we're going to re-rent that space. I know people that were doing that before COVID hit and they got spanked bad. It, if you don't do it right, if you don't do the underwriting right, uh, yeah, it's it, it can hurt. But it's we we don't suggest that strategy to anybody. If anybody ever asks us if we should do the arbitrage play, our answer is always no. If you want our honest opinion, we always say it's better you know to buy the asset and you know downside is long term appreciation, which again, as you said, Todd, usually happens over time. 
Uh, and you actually, you know, if you do the arbitrage fees, you really have no assets. You're only carrying liabilities and contracts and leases and everything else associated with it. Mm -hmm. Amir, let's talk about before we close this down, I want to talk about subscription based living. Do you see one day that we're going to have so many of these Airbnbs because what are they going to do with them that they may just go ahead and join, like you just said, this, this service that basically you may list it and just rent it long term, you know, longer term monthly rentals, but to buy into these subscription ideas where people don't need furniture. I mean, look, I'm not, you know, we, it's not a political channel. We never get into that. But that it's been said that Wall Street wants to be our landlord. And it's also been said that, uh, you know, the World Economic Forum, I think, you know, there's a term floating out there. Though I actually looked it up and they said, well, they didn't really say this, but we're just going to go with it anyway because I believe it. It's rent and be happy. Why, I mean, why own? I mean, we yeah. rent everything. We rent our movies. We rent clothes we share, I mean, you can, I mean, think about it, you know, are we going to be yeah. just renting and being happy, live wherever, don't own any furniture, just the clothes on I, our back? Yeah, man, uh, I definitely am seeing trends of it. I, I myself cannot imagine myself living that way for what it's worth. You know, we actually just built a house and I'm extremely happy that we're not living in a rental anymore just because I like to own and like to have a garage that I can do things in. But I can definitely see that being the case uh, in, in, in the younger generation. I'm in my mid thirties, you know, the, you know, if, if, if people, we have some employees in the twenties who will kind of live that lifestyle. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if it's going to be a strict subscription model, um, unless it's like almost like an elite, like join the elite mansion community of staying at these elite properties. What I'm seeing now on the ground is multifamily developers partnering with multifamily operators they're saying as part of our lease and our um basically our operated infrastructure we're going to give people or tenants the ability to sign a one-year lease at our property but then uh have the ability to go live elsewhere for a few months at a time and we will help fulfill their units when they're vacant with short-term rental guests so that's that, that's I think hmm. becoming a little bit more of a prominent model where you know somebody will develop a 200 unit multifamily building in in Baltimore you know and they'll say hey if you rent this Todd you can stay here you know you'll sign up on your lease and when you're gone we'll operate as a short term rental for you so that you offset some of your costs there and you can go stay at a short term rental in in Austin hmm. um, so it's more of like a, a twist on traditional long term rentals that gives you the flexibility to. Use it as a short-term rental as you They want. usually come at a um, premium, though. Apartments are doing that now. They're saying, hey, if you want a six-month lease, you know, we'll rent it to you, but it's 30% more right. for your monthly rent. Yeah, ex exactly. And these groups are not. My understanding is that they do not charge you a premium to give you that flexibility. It's just an amenity that they offer to compete with the uh, multifamily building next door that's offering you, you know, a, a pet washing station or whatever the case may be. So it's like a... Um, one up on the amenity set um, for 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 landlords. Um, is it going to go to subscription wide? Wide, maybe. Uh, but I think well, you know it's happening, on, right? It's going to be more like like a luxury elite type situation. You you know it does exist yeah. now, right? Right, I do, I do. I yeah. just don't think I just don't know how much uptick it has from my experience in it compared to the um, the uh, multifamily groups allowing their tenants to, to sublet first time. Well, I don't operate. even think it's sublet. I think it, what's happening is these companies are buying buildings in these major metropolitan areas, right? And then basically what they're saying is, you know, uh, focus on your life, not a lease. And as long as you stay within their, you know, um, their owned, you know, or shared Right, you know, uh, property network of, yeah. sets, network yep. of properties, then they can basically go. You want to go to Chicago and live for a month? Eh, no problem. Pack up. I mean, what are you packing up? The clothes on your back, right? A couple of duffel bag, a suitcase. You don't even need a car, man. You can ride share. You can Uber, you can Lyft, whatever. You can, you know, uh, take mass transportation, go. You, you have your laptop. You're working anywhere. You're working remotely. 
I don't know. I I see. You know, I, and there there are. I mean, look. There's a big. There's a controversial issue, right? Because I love the the idea of ownership too. But I've also watched a lot of people get hurt by ownership. I mean, you know, we never saw house prices decline like we did in the 08 crash. I mean, from World War II, really, I mean, we did nothing but appreciate, right? A couple bumps in the road, but despite double-digit, you know, uh, you know, 1980s double-digit interest rates, we still flattened out, you know, and kept going up, 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 up. Then we saw you know, people that bought in 2006 after the the 08 crash. They there were some people, man, that they could not even get out of the purchase price that they bought in 2006 until this last year, right? Right. That's not an investment, right? That we are teaching people about. So I think all these people that were affected by that or burned by that, and depending on what's going to happen now in the next 12 to 18 months, I mean, there are a lot of people that believe, me included, that you can't just jack home prices up 40% way over wage growth and expect that there's not going to be some kind of a downturn as a result. I mean, we'd, be, we'd have our heads in the sand, I think, right? Unless we stimulate, unless we do some other you know, magical things, print a bunch of money with I guess they have the ability to do. Yeah. But my point is, is that for these people, you know, that are looking at, they can't afford a house. I mean, they're going, man, I've, I went to college. I have a master's degree. I'm actually working or living in the same city that I work. And I still can't find a job as a single person to where I can even buy a townhome, right? In that vicinity. So they're looking and they're going, okay, well, I mean, that's kind of depressing, Right, they went. To, they did everything that they thought that they should do or could do, and they have great jobs, but their employer's not paying them enough to where they can live. Right, so I think that these types of if if people start to give up hope of dream the dream of home ownership or realize that you know what it's not such a great idea replacing a roof or heating an air system, I don't know, man. I think it may become surprisingly popular as we're now seeing people living on cruise ships. You've seen that. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, not, nothing nothing surprised me. I mean, we've seen it across the board. I mean, even the car industry these days, we've seen uh, the prices were so inflated over the last, you know, at the beginning of 2022. Now, you know, Tesla's lowering their price by $15,000 so they can get, you know, yeah. you know, cars off the, off the uh, off, well, for them, they don't have them at dealerships, off their site, right? Uh, it's, yeah. um, I think, it's well, there's always a uh, there's a, there's always a set of overcorrections, right? COVID happened, we overcorrected there, and then COVID we, exp- we we rebounded. Now there's no overcorrection to that. It's just it's cyclical, really. So um, yeah, you know. But one thing we you know in most places, real estate over time has been the best performing asset and perform given everyone the best best returns historically speaking over the last hundred years. So um, this still seems, all things considered, the best place to to put your money. Um, yeah well we appreciate you man thank you guys for watching and hey how about it you know what a great guest and man you gave so much value and great information tonight guys if you like this video you can let all of us know that you did by hitting that thumbs up and as always we appreciate you excuse me subscribing man my voice is finally going out today amir all of his contact information is in our show notes. If you want to reach out to him, visit his website. If you're interested in learning more about Airbnbs, you can actually buy them through his website. You can, he has properties that are available for purchase and, uh, you know, that are already set up. And, uh, yeah, Amir, parting, parting thoughts? I appreciate the, the time. I appreciate the tough questions. It's an it's a emerging asset class. I know everybody has questions about it. So, Hoping to provide as much context as I have. Hopefully you guys found this helpful and informative. So thank you for having me. And thanks everyone Absolutely. for listening in. Melissa, thank you. Thank you, Amir. Awesome information. Thank you so much. And Todd, I'll see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. And guys, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Sachs Realty, Maryland Broker, number 607720, office number 443-318-4516.